which had nothing to do with us, so then, and they just they took them to preserve it. They were starting to catalogue all this stuff, and they found this map a month ago. I mean, it must have been an absolutely mind-boggling experience. And that, it was then, there was a flurry of interest in it, and then that died down. In about 1970, people did begin to think perhaps they should look at it. First of all, it was dismissed, as I hinted in my note. It was dismissed as being inaccurate, it wasn't a real map. They were looking at it through 20th century eyes, which of all people the National Map Library shouldn't. Um, and, uh, and so it was disregarded, it was thought to be just a bit of, you know, somebody's just drawn a little map and it's not very good. And then various people began to work on, on, the, on the map, trying to interpret it. The, the most appropriate one from the point of view of most readers is the work by Nicholas Brooks and Graham Whittington, who were then lecturers in St. Andrews, uh, one in geography, one in medieval history. And they then studied the, the rest of St. Andrews in the modern times, looking back at the medieval material. And uh, they came up with all sorts of. You'll see one plan, I only put one in, but they, they, they did lots of measured plans of the town showing the history of it and linking that back to, to the Getty map, what, what the Getty map told them and what they could tell us about the map from their work. And then the Graham Men, Robert Smart, who was the university archivist, did a little article on, on the map, which is also very useful. And he was the one that put date on it of 1580. Some of you thought I had made a mistake about the day uh, we put on the program 1530. <laughs> 1530 is not far off, but 1580 is the received wisdom of the date of it. And I'll come back to why that is, but Bob Smart is the first person to actually look at the map, look at the original, and come up with that date. Uh, and also to come up with the name Getty uh, as the most likely person to be able to kill it. And then the other most interesting one of all was the work of Monsignor Matt Roberts from the Catholic Commission, Heritage Commission, who um, organized this, this book um, to study all sorts of aspects of medieval St. Andrews in the 16th century. Remember, that's just prior to the Reformation we're talking about. And he also did a little a short piece in that book about the map, which is very telling. And then it, the flurry of activity stopped. And it was because I was doing an excavation. If any of you know St Andrews, uh, Crawford's Bakery, that used to be almost next door to Woolworths, neither of which are there now, of course. Um, and I noticed that on the Getty map, which I'd begun to research in relation to excavations in the town, I noticed that there was a door on one of the buildings just near at the end of Market Street, east end of Market, uh, west end of Market Street. I noticed this on the on the wall, and when we were excavating, we found a door at the right, the right sort of level, exactly <coughs> the right sort of place, and I thought, oh well, all these people who sniff at the map, maybe they're wrong, maybe the map is more correct than they think, and there'll be reason for the problems with it. So I'm going to talk you through some of these in a minute. The starting point for everybody's journey to understanding the, the John Getty map began in 1843, rather earlier than all the other things I've mentioned, when Bishop Lyon wrote a history of St Andrews, and in that he produced a drawing, a, a map of St Andrews, um, very crude, badly copied, I would think, because I've not seen the one he started with. Uh, that was just a, a very poor reproduction in the book. Uh, but it was recognized by Lyon as probably 1830 to 1840 uh, in date, and he gave in his book he gives various reasons for suggesting that. Everybody was full of disbelief. You couldn't have a map that displayed all the qualities of this map at that early date. There was just a time when mapping was becoming quite important. Uh, it was just before the pond maps were being prepared and a lot of other atlases were being created to try and get people to understand 
the countries they lived in. It wasn't just in, in Scotland. And so after the flurry of activity then, in 1843, it all died down again until the, in the 1970s. So that's the background to it. Uh, two places in particular are important for the interpretation, and then I will have a look at the scene. First of them is the castle, and this is where a lot of the disputes arise, because the castle looks different from today, and it looks different from a lot of interpretations of what the castle should look like. So we'll come back to that point. Another oddity of the map is it's actually done as a bird's eye view. It's known, if you ever hear of the bird's eye view, that's the map they're talking about, this one. The idea of making a, a drawing, a map, as if it was an air photograph, in the middle 15th, 16th century is quite incredible. Especially in a place like St. Andrews, where there isn't a hill in sight that you could possibly get up and try and visualize the idea of being a bird above it all. We don't know if that's how he thought, but it's what he's trying to show. And then the other problem is that he shows the three streets as parallel. So I shall see if I can get this to come on now. Uh, he shows the, the streets as three parallel streets, which everybody conveniently forgets stop here in the middle of market, near the market street. He shows these two, three streets as parallel. Now to us, having seen photographs, being able to get up to the top of the towers, it doesn't seem strange that we know that that's wrong. But just imagine it if you were a student wandering around the streets of St. Andrews, never thinking about the whole thing, but just wandering around from where you were lodging to where you went to your lectures, where you went to buy a loaf of bread or whatever, you wouldn't really think about it. You would just assume that they were parallel. And that has given rise to all the problems with interpreting this map uh, for everybody historians, for archaeologists, for geographers, and so on. Uh, because the, the, everybody said, oh, well, it, he's matched on. And in particular, this bit here, he's got a duplication. He's actually made, a, 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 there are duplicates of, the, of each other, the two halves, um, to fill the space, because his three parallel streets made it impossible to, to get the thing right. If he'd known that they were converging, of course he would have just drawn what he actually saw. Um, so those are the sort of main bones of contention about the map. And what I'm going to do now is take you on a walk, not a systematic walk around the borough, but a, a walk from interesting place to interesting place. And we'll have a look at some of the details and consider how we arrive at a possible date. Um, and also how the work was compiled. I'll start with that point and then we'll look at the map. It's on a, a very fine piece of fine quality French paper. The lettering, uh, it's up here. That's the only writing on it. Uh, that lettering is in a, a very fine hand. It's <coughs> thought possibly to be French, but not necessarily. It could be something from the library or the university. But all of this is of, consists of the, the nature of the paper, the nature of the ink, and the nature of the lettering suggests the date around 1580. And that's perfectly reasonable. I agree with it entirely from all the things that I've been told. And also, the, um, the fact that they could find somebody within the university who could have drawn it. This is where the bone of contention really arises, and I firmly believe that somebody drew the map. Have you ever done a piece of work where you've scribbled bits on bits of paper, and eventually you've had to bring them all together as a dissertation or whatever? It's that sort of principle. Somebody finally drew it in this, this form, and it wasn't necessarily the person who did all the drawing. But it would be, it's consistent with all the evidence, it's consistent 
was the idea of it being finally put into this paper form in about 1580. And John Getty was a suitable person, a candidate for that, because he was a student of mathematics, Westwood, the professor of mathematics at St. Andrews at the time, was beginning to be interested in geography, and he actually taught what we would now call geography, obviously in a very primitive way. And he also taught surveying and, and what we would call map making, so that kind of surveying. And so Getty had the, a kind of background that was appropriate for this, and so he could well have put it all together. However, we know from the, the later Timothy Pond and a lot of other <coughs> early map makers, they didn't produce their maps as a single piece of work. They produced them on scraps of paper, backs of envelopes as it were, on little scraps of paper. And that's what must have happened here, and the, the original collection of the information, and then it's been neatly put together as in the final form. So now if I can well, try and talk you through this up to stand on here. Um, the, the, main, the, the castle was not the foundation building of, of St. Andrews. The foundation building was probably uh, about here, which is where the, um, down here, where the Church of St. Mary of the Rock was built. And in fact, if you go to St. Andrews today, you can actually see uh, the foundations of the building. And that was, roughly speaking, where the Pictish church would have been. And the Pictish settlement must have been somewhere around here. Now, um, everything you read about St. Andrews will tell you that it was built, focused on this picture settlement somewhere around here, and that the two roads, the North Street and the South Street, known as North Gate and South Gate, these two were converging on that picture settlement. We don't know where the picture settlement really was, it's a lot of nonsense at the moment, but it's the best way we were to get because there's no doubt that the roads do come towards here. That one's going heading straight out here, and this one is heading straight past the settlement in that direction. But that's just because of a problem of, of the mapping. So the focus of the town was on the, the early church site, which would have been here, and you've got the cathedral here, and um, the, the cloister with its one tree, Historic Scotland actually planted one tree in the middle of it for a while. Um, and all the first cloistral buildings have shown in great detail. And the first church that we know about, <coughs> not the primary of the rock, which is not shown on here because it wasn't uncovered, is the, the original little church. Uh, you've got a tiny little nave here, and a little choir here, and the naps rather, and then the tower. I bet you all would say, I think, why well, there? Oh, uh, those towers so tall, they look ridiculous. If you were an artist, you'd do that too. <laughs> it's not intentional, in, in the sense of not, it's not like reproducing it as if you're making a photograph of the side. It's done because otherwise, up here, you have a great empty space. And it's to fill the space, I think. The other, and, and there's another thing. Um, at the time, we're talking about the date around 11.50, the starting of the of the cathedral, this building is a contentious one in the sense that um, lots of records would suggest it was somewhere in the 9th, 10th century, but can I be really cynical? There are lots of people who won't allow anything exotic to happen in Scotland before St. Barbara in 1077. So that's, that's the received date for this, which it doesn't look right. If you look at Darwin Cathedral, built in the 1070s, and look at this pathetic little thing in comparison, in comparison, it doesn't look right, but the stonework is superb. It may be small, but the stonework is superb, and exactly of the other data. More, more like Anglo-Saxon work, but not only really early, but Anglo-Saxon work, say around 10, 10 so that's the, the, the building of that day, the tower, was very important for people coming in from the sea. And as you'll see here, the sea was very important. But St. Andrews, we'll come back to this point in a minute, 
So the man doesn't have much of a harbour. All these boats are lying on their sides because the tide's out. <coughs> and if you had a cargo to unload, you had to have tenders coming out to, to empty your boat. So it was never going to be a, a big harbour or an important place on that side. The thing is that sailors need something to look at quite. And so from out way over in the North Sea, they would be able to see some of these towers. And we know, for example, that Mark Inch, which is just down the coast a few miles, is an example of that. It's got an excessively high tower on a church that's on a little hill. And this can be seen from miles out at sea, I'm told. I'm not, I don't like sailing, so I'm not going out to find out. <laughs> but, um, but the point is that down the coast there are lots of churches that are built with high towers to help sailors find a way to, to take them back into the harbours. So that's partly why the towers are tall, and the other lot the half part is probably just to fill that empty space. But it doesn't look right, you see an empty space down here. Um, the layout of the town, uh, starting with the church and the early settlement, which was here, and this area here. So you've got a little enclave around the Pictish Royal uh, site. So when they laid out the, uh, the, the town as such, they start here with some Salvators, the castle obviously, and then a lot of other buildings that follow. There's the town church. But the town's church was originally down here, just at the back of the, the, the St. Rose Tower. <coughs> So we're now going to have a little look at some of these um, in more detail. <coughs> this is Graham Whittington's map of the of the, how the town grew, and there's the original Holy Trinity Church beside St. Paul's Tower, squashed between the two, uh, the cathedral and the tower. And in 1410, they moved the parish church from here to where it is now, in the middle of the town. Um, foundations for this have actually been were found in the 19th century. Uh, unfortunately, there's no chance of trying to do an excavation now because there are graves all over the place and you just can't. There's the size of St. Mary's the Rock down here. So the town grew with the earliest site part of it uh, here in the out, outskirts of the precinct of the cathedral, uh, so these are the earliest, but, and then the next stage of development across here and out towards the centre, towards where the Holy Trinity was built, and then you've got the dotted areas here are the second stage of building, and then eventually the, the last stage before the town took its final form, and everything since then has been a question of infilling. Just a quick view of the um, <coughs> area immediately opposite the cathedral. And this is the uh, difficult this is the difficult area where Getty had to duplicate what he could see in order to fill his space. But apart from that it's, it's uh, this tower for example, the Tower is still there. The Abbot's residence is still there, although rather more elaborate than it used to be. A view from the top of the St. Rose Tower. I'm sorry it's a bit grubby, but it's the only one I had on digital. All my best information is still on slides. But from the top of the tower, you can see the layout of the streets here, and there's the North Street here. And Market Street comes up the middle, but stops before it gets as far as the cathedral. And I don't think. Yet he can have been up the tower. It may have not been possible for him to do that because whoever drew this, I don't think had been up even the town tower um, or, or St. Salvator's tower. Because if you did that, you would actually see the, the, the streets do converge. So either he couldn't do that or for some reason um, he was not believing it. So just to remind you then, he was. Uh, if he'd been up this tower, he could have been up this one, he could have been up one of the cathedral towers, uh, or indeed up the parish church tower. So there are all sorts of ways you could get above the tower, but he would not have given you 
the right impression. I've been up some of these towers, and I, I, I can see that it's very difficult, especially from here or from the church here. You, you do get a feeling that the streets are parallel. Now, looking at the access to, to St. Andrews, the um, <coughs> see these, these are all 16th century uh, galleons of one kind or another. You can see how rocky the coast is. The, there was a little harbour here, but it would only take tiny boats. Um, so the main <coughs> harbour is actually just down, uh, what down, down here, you can see it, you can see it. But uh, access was always going to be difficult because the harbour was totally tired. And looking at the harbour in more detail, you can see here, you can see the boats here down <coughs> on their sides. But what's very nice, if you look at the attention to detail, and the rough, the round about independence has, isn't new, because half of these, a, a lot of these boats that are Scottish are, are, are flying the salt tire. Which is a nice, you know, it's an, an attention to detail. But there's a lot of them are flying other flags, which I haven't bothered to try and analyze. And as I say, the, the tide is obviously go, going out, and so half of these are just lying on their side. That one particularly you can see. And that's no way to run a, any kind of trade, marine trade. Now, when you came ashore, you would go ashore here, where you, where you could put off one of these smaller tender boats or the ones that could come in here, <coughs> and you would be faced by this is storage buildings and a harbour master's house, um, a mill building here, and the, and the tower laid. There's the mill <coughs> here, and the tower laid. Back. And in fact, it's still there. It's covered up. But it's still there behind all the houses, and it runs out for about two miles out of town, a mile out of town, I think. Now, the the cathedral details we can see a little bit better here. But when you actually get a chance to look at, at an example of the map, look at the penmanship, how all these tracery windows are depicted. Um, particularly this window here, this um, south window, is quite amazing. The, the detail of the penmanship is, is just mind-boggling. To think that somebody was doing that with a quill pen. Have any of you tried to use a quill pen? It's like doing it with a spade. <laughs> it's like big broad end. But how he's done that it was such a fine, presumably a fine rather than a, maybe a very, very, very fine brush. But nevertheless, it's an incredible solution. Um, and all the details will be very closely thinking, just as you'd expect. And then you've got the pen that leads, if you're coming up from the harbour, you come up here through this. It's not unroofed, it's left like that so you can see that the road goes right through. Now, this is a, a, an ingenious technique which wasn't necessary because, of course, if you came up here and you looked to here and there was a roof, you'd still see the other side when you went through, so it's a, a little hiccup. This is the uh, earliest of the colleges, uh, not, not the earliest church, but the earliest of the colleges apart from St. Salvators. And if you look in detail at this, you can see that it's, there's all sorts of things that are arguing about, um, which we'll leave for now. But this is the college quad. Um, the, the, main road going to the castle. Now, I want to press on a bit. You need to keep it all the time for me. If you look at a harbour today, it, it's still tidal all the time. It's, it, it's a very difficult harbour to get in and out of. And this is St. Mary of the Rock. Um, that's pointing to east. And we've got the transept here, uh, the west on this side. Um, that was a, a lot of that was excavated in the 19th century and had loaded tiles on the floor, so it's quite a nice building. Just to show you some details, there's a, a guest house within the library. I'm not sure what that building <coughs> is. Um, and then these are uh, buildings, there's a tennis court here now. Um, and here you've got one of the original gates into the, into the Abbey precinct. 
looking in more detail at the cathedral, and you see here this splendid tracery. And look at this all around. This is the dormer um, areas, and here it, the church has been shown without a roof. It may well not have had a roof when Gay was doing this, um, but if it had, it would only be patchy. But you can see the <coughs> tracery windows, and look at the detail on that, even in this photograph. Um, and again, you see all the excess height on the, on the towers. The other thing to notice is because you can't see anything there now except the War Memorial. This is the site of the War Memorial. That's the gatehouse, the original gatehouse from the King to the Abbey. Uh, that would be for really important visitors who were going in through that gate they were coming in from the west. Now, that has been completely lost, and as it happened, the War Memorial, this uh, the Lorimer building, was falling down. And so the council decided they'd take it apart stone by stone and rebuild it. And surprise, surprise, when they got down to the lowest levels and they were starting to uh, get ready to put foundations in, they started finding bones. So I was sent along to watch this and there were perhaps as many as 20 graves there. Several of them disturbed, but others were intact. And lots and lots of bits of building stone, lots of slates from the roof, a couple of bits of glass. And I had a look at the map. I thought, oh my goodness me, there's been a house here. So we eventually found out that it was the gatehouse. And interestingly, there's a track across here, but that little bit of the, of the graveyard has never been used. It's still blank, and there are all sorts of theories about what it might be, but it's related, I think, to a church and other churches and across here somewhere <coughs> where other burials are. But these were medieval burials that we saw there. They were not, not early ones. No, that's all. This is just looking at the area immediately in front of the west end of the cathedral, where you see the edge of market speed coming up against um, the, uh, the east-west road, and this is all the early housing. And you can see the little tiny plots, they're all irregular. This is the, what's known now as Dean's Court, and that's the sort of copy of it. It's not quite a copy, in fact, as everybody says, if we do the pro proper analysis. But um, there aren't, and there never have been as many buildings here as you'd think. But um, the details of the way the plots are, but these are little fences. Can you see the little uprights? <laughs> the little fences. I think that, that sort of detail is fascinating. And then all the houses differ uh, in detail. Some of them are sheds, some of them are workshops. Uh, some of them are stables, and one or two of them are actually houses. St. Leonard's College, artistic license. The, the chapel is shown far too small. It's only got two bays and it should have four. And this building here isn't there now, so we don't know quite um, have what, what was happening to the chapel in, behind that porch affair. But this, this lane is still there. The tower was taken away in the 19th century when the, um, one of the university professors, using his immense power, decided that it was very inconvenient for him to take his carriage around here through the pen and into the gate, there's a gate in there, um, to get home. So he would have the tower, which was blocking his way here, he'd have the tower removed. Um, and so this tower must be different from the later tower that was removed in the 19th century. So this must have been a porch extension on the church, and what you see today is slightly different. That's the actual original church building. This wall was rebuilt after the tower was removed, the tower was removed <coughs> up here. This is, and it's, it's pockmarked with all sorts of little bits of decoration off that tower and they've just been plonked in there. So don't be taken in by it. It's not nice medieval carving on the west end of the church. It's actually all bits gathered together from the dismantled tower. Um, and this is, this is actually a new west end. Um, and they took down the porch, which was the Malumbi bit that we saw attached to the church. And I did some excavations here when 
Arts and Learners College was, wanted to do some work, and we found what must have been an extension of the chapel and a part of the tower here. And we actually found a door with all the metal studs from the oak door and lying on the, in the foundations. So, uh, no. Moving now to the primary part of the university, uh, the St. Silvertus Chapel. And again, you see he's only got two bays. Oh, I think there are seven or eight, in fact. But it's because when you do a drawing like this, you start off like Kittywinks do. You, you make a spot in different places, and then you have to fit everything else in. It becomes like a corset. So he didn't allow being in a plot to put the chapel onto. Um, but in his day, there was a fancy doorway on the tower, which isn't there now. It's actually attached to a gate somewhere about here. This is more or less true to the general shape of the building. Again, a very high tower, got a clock face on it, um, fine weather vane on the top. And um, much of this still, still survives hidden behind extensions of work. This building is still here. What you're looking at there is its gable end. So you as it were, you're looking at the facade of the building. At the same time, you're actually looking at the gable end. He's had to turn it round to be able to show you what it looks like. Um, and what he's then done, he's shown you here a little vignette of down the lane. <laughs> this is the but what's known as Butts Wine. Uh, the gate isn't there any longer, um, but that's the way down all the men had to go and do, do archery practice once a week, and that's there, and they converge from wherever they live, and they all walk down here. Out of the, um, but this house here is known variously as Admiral Cracker's house because it's where the, it, the story was supposedly written. Um, but that house is still there. This is the detailed uh, drawing of, of what Getty depicted. And actually, if you stand outside the building and count, you can see all these windows, and you can see these, and notice the doors, there's a central door, the two side doors, and then this very big window, and you can actually see that there was a blocked up window there if you stand and look at it. And to my shame, when I was president of the, of the local preservation <coughs> trust, one of our members, who were our trustees, an eminent physics professor, decided it would look nice if on the current frontage of the building you put a, a plaque to tell us all about it so it blocks the view of the blocked up doorway. <laughs> um, and nothing would shift him. In fact, the harder he tried, the more determined he was to put it in the wrong place. So it's, it's in the wrong place. But look, that's the building today. Here's the plaque. But what it, I want to direct your attention to the arch here, the relieving arch for the doorway here. You can see the side of it there, and another one here. You can see a, an archway there, another archway window until there. Um, you have to look hard to see where that big window was because it's been partly blocked by the current windows. And the round tower is still there with lots of changes that you can identify on the dead getting away if you really want to. And this has all been re so it doesn't look right, but it's approximately the same as it was. Now, that's only one of many, many buildings in the town that do still survive. This one is on the other side of the chapel. Um, there's a chapel here. And this house, again, is shown on the map in great detail. This is all new. That's it in detail. Inside it, it's got some uh, very early columns, I mean, I would think possibly as early as 12th and 13th century, but there's been so much messed around you can't really tell. Back to the map now. So we've been looking at this. Um, you notice here, you've got Buxwine, which you looked at here. You went down, you can go to archery practice, you walk down here, and you went across here to the Butts down there. This is our car park for the Golf Museum. Um, we're going to look at the town church and look at the Greyfriars building here and uh, then we'll uh, just come back and have a look at the body. There's the, this is the town church 
the one that was moved from beside the cathedral. Um, apart from this sort of rather lumpy end of it here, it is very much like that today, except in the meantime, in 1906 or thereabouts, it was dismantled and then rebuilt. Following a fairly uh, accurate layout, um, and, um, but the tower is still the original tower, and you can see most of the details here on, on the actual tower itself. We have a porch like this that stands out at the south side, um, and the main entrance is here just as it is in the body. What is different, and this, is, this intrigued me for ages, I spent most of my life actually doing a burial, so I'm not intrigued with it, but I like, quite like graveyards. Here is an unusual feature. Graveyard around the church, there's a, 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 another area <coughs> behind here which must be part of the graveyard, I think. It's not really garden ground. A little, it might be a ducot in here, or it might be a kiln. Uh, again, a, a, a little post fence. But look at all the entrances. They're not broken down, it's, they are actually entrances. There's a gate across that one. <coughs> and, um, and so, this was before gravestones were in great use, so you wouldn't expect to find gravestones in it. But this is roughly the middle of South Street now, and whenever workmen, when I was working at the university, because I was doing sites and monuments work, I was often asked to go and look at things in the town. So the workmen all knew where to find me, but they didn't come to the university, they came to the house. <laughs> they would be digging, digging holes here for putting in services of some kind or repairing electric wires or whatever. <coughs> They'd always find bones. They always took home the skulls <laughs> until the wife threw it out. <laughs> so you never got any chance to see the skulls, but they brought a, they the bones in a big plastic bag. And they would come and knock on my kitchen window at dinner time and hold up this bag. <laughs> 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 and I had no choice but to collect them. <laughs> it was quite entertaining, but pretty irritating as well. But um, <coughs> behind me there is the old townhouse, the tall booth, its tower. Um, the the, the various market crosses. This is where all the great uh, <coughs> markets were made all burned in that area. But the important one is that was all taken down by a man called Playfair in the 19th century. And he built the new, um, he built the new ones from over here. And he was there today. So, obviously, come back. This is the um, west end of Market Street. So, there's the townhouse we were just looking at and the, um, the parish church. And this is the Greyfriars, the Franciscans, over here. Now, their building has gone. I'm sure the foundations are there and bits of wall are hidden in the angle buildings that are there. But the, this wall here still exists. Um, the traces of that are all gone underneath the modern roadways. Um, but that wall is still there. You remember I mentioned about the, the, the house that had the door in it? There it is. That little door. And this is where Crawford's Bakery was eventually. <coughs> so when we were excavating, apart from finding all sorts of interesting structural things and uh, so on, we actually found that doorway and the windows in the gate blend. So it's that one little thing that shows that getting, getting attention to detail was, was good. But what you can see here, he's obviously depicting what he could see of all the buildings, but these are not just sort of multiple copies, they're all different. Um, and you've got little sheds at the back of them, um, some with many windows, some with big doors, so, and then you've got little workshops out of them, out here in the garden ground, and a very wobbly back lane, back line where they each individual householder arranged with, on this side, and that side, they arranged together to put the boundary where they decided it. So it's all haphazard, it's not quite nice. Now, the other uh, major university building is St Mary's College, uh, 
of which you're looking at a bit of it here, and a bit of it here. But this is a building that has been forgotten. It's been washed out of the university's history as far as possible. It's actually where the university began before Bishop Wardlow started on St. Salvators. It's the St. College of St. John. And there's actually a very surprising amount of it depicted there, although it wasn't being used at the time. This is, we're talking at the moment of a date of somewhere between 1538 and 1543, because that's when St. Mary's College was built. Um, these are all still there, but they've been enlarged a bit, so you can't actually see all the details you really want to have a look at it. But they are, are all still there. This is largely gone because they put uh, the 19th century buildings all around here. And this is gone. It's underneath what's now known as Parliament Hall. Because uh, there was a medieval parliament out there one day. Well, from, yes, one day. <laughs> That's just showing you a little more detail. Um, you can see here uh, the fine windows in this, the nice buttresses against the building, the doorway, and in the cleaner's cupboard, you can see traces of that. <laughs> showed it to me there. This is looking from the inside, uh, out onto the Mark Road South Street. And this is the current uh, doorway out through, and this is the Master's Lodge here. That's the building you were looking at face on. And then this is the beginning of the actual student lodging. Now, just a few yards along the street from the from the um, St Mary's College is the site of the Black Friars, which is here. And it's all its lands run right back to the to the burn, to the Killisburg, the site of the site. And it was because that was where the um, Black Friars were. And the church is all here under this grass. But the boundary line between the church building lands and the property they own behind is just on the front of here. And when they were seeking to build the secondary school with the proper first academy in the St. Andrews, they could do it because the Black Forest site was vacant. <coughs> We've got, this is the back of South Street, you're looking at here. This is a new street that was put through just in place of a lane. Um, and this is known as Westbury Lane today. And that's Abbey Street here. Now, in Getty's day, there were little houses here in front of the boundary wall of St. Leonard's College. So they had very tiny little plots of ground. And these must have all been little shops rather than houses. But notice here, these are the grand houses. This one is the house that was given to Maynard at the Fleming when he laid out the town eventually. He was given three plots, three long rigs to himself, which is why the corner house is still a much bigger house than any other in the town. And then all the others were given double rigs. So you see that they're all exactly the same width. And they're very wide, much wider than the rigs of the rest of the time. But they can still come up with grub shops and uh, lodging houses and uh, stables and dog houses and whatever else you have in the back garden. Um, these are really very faithful reproductions of what was there. Many of those buildings are actually still, the lower floors are still there. You know, 15th century buildings probably, certainly early 16th. Um, it's this one. Uh, it's now known as number 46 South Street. Uh, the lady who owns that has tried hard to have all sorts of studies done on, back down in the basement down below. You, you can pick up the foundation line. Um, <coughs> this is the frontage, the 19th century frontage of those buildings that you were just looking at the back of. And you can see the width of the plots. That's the second one along the, this one here. It's the, the three, three weeks wide one. But this is a double one here. So it's that. They're all double legs. That's the same as this one. Um, and when you look at them, you can see doorways above, and doorways of 
so on. So there have been lots of changes, but they are essentially the buildings that were still that were there already in the late 16th century. So this is the one that, uh, yes, this is 46. This is the one where a lot of work has been done at the basement level. When you go into the house, you go down about two or three feet on steps. And in the back garden, there's all sorts of stone work. So, moving from the college, I want to have a little look at these houses along here. Big time, and I could uh, make bigger pictures of them. You'll see a lot of detail here. But I want to look here at that building there, and the little one next door to it. <coughs> here in this building is currently, if you know some libraries, it's the medieval history building. And it actually is exactly like that. It hasn't really changed. Uh, they've heightened it a bit. And many various little things <coughs> poured concrete through it to hold it together and then things but you can actually see all these doors. You've got a main door which now has columns outside it, but that door is there and that one. And this door. There's a straight joint here. There's just a little slip of wall about eight feet wide. And behind it there's nothing, just the space. And you can see there's a gable here, and a gable here, and that goes through into the back garden of this building. Um, it's had dormers which have been allowed to be taken down. The dormers are not complete. But this one is the one that I excavated, but it was supposed to be going to be my office. Not in that stage, but we actually found that building behind the lobby frontage. We found a, a little pathway leading in. A cobble, cobble pathway here, we found this wall and we had a great big loop across it, um, which is still there. And uh, it had been just a, a little shop. How, how it stood up, I don't know. All the, what you see today, the windows that you see on either side of the doorway today, had ship's timbers, cut up ship's, ship's timbers for the roof. None of them was more than about that long. And then all this, the, the, the window lintels were broken. All of the points have collapsed. <coughs> as I was excavating here, we discovered that the, the frontage of the building, it was in, it was in, in front of this, uh, here. The, the, the modern facade that you see was coming away from this old building at the back. And so architects had to be brought in, and they literally poured tons and tons and tons of liquid cement through the building. Uh, it's beginning now to have a problem, but never mind. Uh, and then this building, you can't, I haven't been able to analyse that, but it, it is still there behind, behind all the modern features. Right, now just to come to an end, more or less, just to remind you of the. the, the Problems of the harbour and the development starting here and shortly in the around 1200, the castle was built. I haven't forgotten about it, but it's the Nazi Mary's, it's an 8th century. The castle here, it's a, it's a two period castle, really, it's a, and it's a royal castle. Sorry, let me start again. It's not a royal castle, it was a, it was a castle for the bishop and then the archbishop. Um, and so it really was linked to the cathedral. And the king stayed there as guests of the archbishop. That's quite an important point. That's who. Here, which unfortunately, because I haven't got the enlargement, 
there is a round tower here, which Getty shows completely its roof. But by, um, and that would, that would fit with the period when the, just after, just before the Reformation, the world, not the castle was attacked. This is the time when Knox was taken prisoner in 1547-ish, I think. This building was intact at that time. A few years later, after Knox and uh, after Beaton had been uh, murdered, um, and the castle had been sacked very largely, uh, of course it changed greatly and it was Hamilton came along and rebuilt most of it and put the new frontage on. So the fact that we've got Getty drawing this with a, a complete tower there pins it down to a date around 18, 1543. So it looks as if that the compilation of this piece of work must have been completed at about that time. Not in the present form on the single sheet of paper, but the original drawings, however they were made, would have been done by that time. Because all the datable bits of the map date to around 1840, 1843. Uh, so there it is here. We know from records it was the building was started in, in 1538, and in 1541, <clears throat> the masons weren't quite sure work was going well, and they, they were masons from, I think, Durham probably. They were sent to inspect the work. And so the, the men were told to get a, get a move on, and they had to get it finished, and the bill was paid in, in 1543. So St. Mary's was there by that time, there's the principal's house here. So all of that was built. Uh, by and paid for by 1543. So it looks very much as if that's the kind of state at which the map was actually made. So Archbishop Lyons, Bishop Lyons' estimate of 1530 to 1540 isn't very far out, and it fits with the, the compilation being completed in 1580 to go off to the uh, Netherlands for the first atlas of towns of Scotland. But it never got there for some reason. So uh, it disappeared uh, until the middle 20th century, and it's now uh, it was very long for us to squabble over and to look at it and be amazed at how much of it is still there. Thank you for listening. It's amazing. 
what, what there are in, what items there are in churches that people suddenly want to have at home. Pews are an obvious thing. What do you do taking a pulpit home? I'm not quite sure. Why. <laughs> but um, I have seen pulpits in houses before now. But um, mostly they go to another church. They're gifted to another church. And similarly, the lecterns and things like the, the eagle lectern, these kinds of things generally move to a, a new church somewhere. But there are lots of things, more ephemeral things. And I don't mean communion plate because that really always is sold. But things like communion tokens. How many of you have seen a communion token recently? Do you even, some of you even know what they are? Yes. A lot of people don't. I'm not questioning you, but it is true. A lot of people don't. But you find them in a little bag somewhere in the back of the church. Now, they're an important part of the history. So, in addition to that, there are wall hangings that have been made by the Women's Guild. Um, many of which are of historical importance, although in terms of legal work they're not always as good as they might be. But a lot of them are, are really very good. Um, I would recommend if any of you venture as far east as Angus, go to a place called Dunnigan, which is, for any of you who are pictophiles, Dunnigan is a very important place. So the village, the church has been closed, and the ladies there had made a most magnificent set of five wall hangings to celebrate the millennium. It's a fantastic piece of work. It, it, one in particular scene, you've got the minister standing marrying a young couple. And he's wearing a kilt, and the kilt is a real kilt. It's just fastened onto this little drawing. He's got knitted socks. <laughs> it's a magnificent piece of work. It's folk art, yes, but it's a very important piece of work. The ch adjacent church, Letham, has a different style altogether, much more flamboyant, but it too had a millennium. I mean, lots of churches have them. What will happen to these when the church is closed is up to the congregation, and anyone could do anything like that with them. Um, all kinds of other things are, are gifted to the back, or given back to the owners. The only thing that remains is the stained glass. So, on the basis of this conversation with the minister, I started thinking about this, and we have carefully gone round and re photographed all, nearly all the five. Concordia and East Five churches to get the interiors now, but the number that have closed, uh, and we've got nothing at all apart from the empty interior and the stained glass, is quite high. Uh, we've still got to be most of West Five and most of the rest of Scotland. So, going back to what I asked for, if any of you would be interested in having a training day um, and joining us in trying to record some, at least, of the churches in Glasgow, uh, before, for example, most of the Catholic churches are going to be closed in the next few years, and of course the Church of Scotland has already closed a lot. So, um, it's not arduous. Uh, two people can record a church in... Oh, you didn't turn yours off, anybody else? <laughs> the level of recording, it's a broad brush approach, and as I say, I'd be happy to come over and, and do a training day, and you do, as long as you've got a partner, you must work with someone else, because health and safety is very important, and it's simple things, it's not like being attacked by somebody, um, tripping off the, the steps from the sanctuary, because you've forgotten you're there, and you step back and you take a picture, you break a leg or something. You need someone else with you. And having done a demonstration of that just, just recently when I took a couple of people to do a training session up near Bray Mar, um, and uh, everything was going well, they'd done the risk assessments and what happened with the boss standing on the wall of the medieval chapel, jumped off or he stepped off and forgot that the cows in the field had left kick holes and put a toe straight in there and found it until the bricks had broken arm. Mm -hmm. So there's a good reason for the uh, for 
taking someone else with you. But if any of you would like to, it is incredibly rewarding because the ministers are always very keen. And the Catholic priests are sometimes harder to, to uh, get access to, but once you get them on board, they're very interesting to talk to. We call it places of worship now. It's not just churches because it includes synagogues and mosques. And we find on the whole the mosques are incredibly welcoming. And the, the, they don't understand what we're doing and why we're doing it, but they still are welcoming. Um, there aren't as many synagogues, of course, now as there once were. And several or five, I think, of the Glasgow ones have all been closed. So I don't know whether we ever get into those. But the real main point is all the different churches and chapels and so on. Um, so anyone who's interested in that, I'd just like your name and address tonight, and we can arrange a, uh, a date to meet. And see if we can make a dent in the something over 700 places of worship in Glasgow. So if you're interested, I'd love to hear from you. And if you're not, thank you for listening tonight. of St. Andrews, both as it now is, and uh, whoops, I know, I think it's right back on the last um, Like, unmuted, now it's better, isn't it? Um, yes, having seen uh, all, all wonderful images, both on the map and in, in the, the flesh of it now is, I think uh, many of us have been moved to go and visit St. Andrews again and have a, a, a good look around. And it certainly is the most remarkable document that I think probably few of us knew very much about. Uh, so uh, it's been uh, a very interesting lecture and uh, most valuable for us. Thank you very much. Thank you.